When it comes to beloved Disney classics, the rags to riches tale of Aladdin remains a favorite among animation fans of all ages. The music is on point, Jafar has the best evil facial hair ever to grace the big screen, and there's a genie. What's not to love here? I'm Leo Camacho with Channel Frederator, and today we're taking a magic carpet ride back to Disney yesteryear. Did you know, like Pinocchio's growing nose, the feather on Aladdin's turban falls into his face whenever he tells a lie? There's more of that good stuff coming your way. And we've got something for everyone as we count down 107 facts about Disney's Aladdin. Let's get started. Number 1. Aladdin is based on a Middle Eastern folktale of the same name that's been told since at least 850 AD. The story was first officially published in France sometime in the 18th century as part of a book filled with other famous Middle Eastern folklore called The Book of 1001 Nights. The book's English translation is simply Arabian Nights. Number 2. Disney's 1992 adaption wasn't the first time the studio dabbled with the film's source material. In 1930, Disney Animation Studios released the Mickey Mouse short film Mickey in Arabia, which contains elements of the Aladdin folklore along with with other tales associated with the Arabian Nights. Number 3. The idea of a Disney-produced Aladdin film dates back as far as 1988, when lyricist Howard Ashman wrote a 40-page treatment for an animated musical adaption for the legend of Aladdin. Had Ashman's full vision been realized, the film would have taken on the form of a campy 1930s musical with the genie character resembling the likes of jazz musicians Fats Waller and Cab Calloway. Number 4. Aladdin is directed by Disney legends John Musker and Ron Clements in their third collaboration. They've also co-directed The Great Mouse Detective, The Little Mermaid, Made, Hercules, Treasure Planet, The Princess and the Frog, and are currently in charge of Disney's newest movie, Moana. Number 5. Musker and Clements turned down the opportunity to direct Beauty and the Beast in order to tackle the tale of Aladdin. How do you choose between those two? Personally, I think they made the right decision. Number 6. The director said they created the film with the intended message of just being yourself, that what's on the inside of you is much more valuable than anything you may or may not have on the outside. They thought this message especially applied to teenagers and is one of the reasons Aladdin and Jasmine are portrayed as such. Number 7. The artist behind Aladdin certainly did their homework in order to capture the essence, vibe, and the curvy architecture of the 15th century world of Islam culture. They did this by studying over 1,800 photos they had taken of ancient sites from a trip they took to Iran. Number 8. Animators tried to make the characters look unrealistic on purpose after working on realistic characters for Beauty and the Beast. Because of this, each character can be broken down into a basic shape. Number 9. The new style of drawing proved to be great for Disney animators, who called the previous movies chiseled realism. The new style allowed animators to work quicker and made the characters easier to follow on screen. Number 10. The characters of Aladdin were made to be curvy in order to rhyme with the curvy architecture all around them. The animators were particularly influenced by the works of legendary artist Al Hirschfeld, who was known for drawing characters comprised almost entirely of curves. In turn, Hirschfeld said that he was honored and flattered that the animators were influenced by him. Number 11. This rule did not apply for Jafar, who was comprised mostly of straight lines and angles. This was done to establish him as the villain that clearly doesn't fit with anybody else. Number 12. The film's color scheme was designed by Richard Vender Wend, with many colors symbolizing certain meanings and themes. The color blue represented water and goodness, red stood for heat and evil, while gold was a neutral color that leaned slightly towards the forces of evil. Number 13. Aladdin was originally intended to take place in Baghdad, Iraq. When the first Gulf War happened, the filmmakers decided to change the location to the fictional land of Agrabah, which is an anagram of Baghdad. Number 14. Quite a few supporting characters were cut from the film, chief among them being Aladdin's mother, who would try her best to guide her son away from the life of a petty thief. On the opposite side of the spectrum were Aladdin's three friends, Bobcock, Omar, and Kasim, three goofballs that were always getting into trouble. They were scrapped in order to simplify the story. Number 15. In the first version of the movie, there were two genies, the genie of the lamp and the genie of the ring. This concept was borrowed from the Aladdin folktale with the genie of the ring being the less powerful of the two. If the genie of the lamp complains about an itty bitty living space, we can only imagine how the genie of the ring must have felt. Circular. Number 16. That's not the only piece pulled closely from the folktale. In the story, Aladdin's genie of the lamp helps him become rich and powerful to marry the Sultan's daughter. No word on if he also changed his name to Prince Ali, though. Number 17. The first full story reel of Aladdin was so badly received by Walt Disney Studio executives that it almost killed production of the film entirely. Members of the crew collectively referred to the day of this screening as Black Friday. The Aladdin team had just eight days to prevent Disney from axing the film by reworking the entire story almost entirely from scratch. Yikes. Number 18. Aladdin's personality came out because Disney animators were tired of using cardboard cutout princes. They wanted 
a story about how the princes fell in love instead of something that was just assumed. Like with the prince in Snow White. I mean, this guy's name is literally just Prince. You can't get any more cardboard than that. Although, if your name is Prince, you can make some pretty good music. Number 19. Aladdin was originally designed to resemble actor Michael J. Fox. The filmmaker soon came to a consensus that perhaps he was a bit too young for a woman like Jasmine, so they redesigned him to look like Tom Cruise. Number 20. According to supervising animator Glenn Keane, Aladdin's design and movements were partially based on MC Hammer, specifically from his appearance and dance moves featured in the music video for You Can't Touch This. Clearly, Aladdin's baggy pants are one of the biggest influences Hammer had on the character. Number 21. One of the biggest challenges the animators faced when designing Aladdin was making Jasmine's eventual attraction and affection for the protagonist believable. They achieved this by giving Aladdin bravado and confidence through his poses and actions, yet filled him with inner insecurities that made him relatable to everybody, even Jasmine. Number 22. Aladdin marked one of the first times that a Disney voice actor didn't also have to be a magnificent singer. The move opened up the world of Disney animation to every actor, which worked out great for Scott Weinger, who ended up voicing Aladdin. His voice cracked while singing during the audition, but he did get to end up dating DJ Tanner, which is pretty good. Number 23. Brad Kane served as the singing voice for Aladdin. He's famously known as the voice behind the original Silly Rabbit Tricks Are For Kids. Number 24. Weinger auditioned for the role of Aladdin with a tape of him and his mother playing the part of Genie. While Disney execs were impressed with his performance and obviously gave him the role, he claimed that his mother nearly stole the show with her portrayal as the genie, which he called a hip Jewish Brooklynite character. The studio joked that if the Robin Williams deal fell through, they would cast her as the genie in a heartbeat. Way to go, mom. Number 25. While genie's voice is iconic, one of the trickiest voices to cast was Aladdin's. Ron Clements said he had to sound old enough to carry the romance, but young enough to have the teenage sound we liked. Number 26. Before settling on Wanger, Clements and Musker spent months auditioning around 60 voices for the role of Aladdin. Wanger didn't even realize he was auditioning for Disney's next big animation movie until a friend told him. Number 27. Linda Larkin provides the voice for Princess Jasmine, but like Aladdin, not for the singing parts. Jasmine's Tony award-winning singing voice, Leah Salonga, would later go on to provide the singing voice for another Disney princess, Mulan. Number 28. Supervising animator Mark Henn based his design of Jasmine off his own sister. He even had photos of his sister next to him at his desk that he used as references when drawing the princess. Number 29. Abu the monkey is related to Curious George, the monkey in Raiders of the Lost Ark, Megatron, Raja, the Cave of Wonders, Hefty Smurf, and Fred Jones. Okay, that might not be canon, but you can trace their lineage back to the same actor, Frank Welker. Number 30. Jafar's design was influenced by another one of Disney's greatest villains, Maleficent from Sleeping Beauty. Not only did they try to visually resemble the Wicked Sorceress, the animators went back to Maleficent and studied how she moved. Number 31. Jafar was originally envisioned as being somebody with a bad, explosive temper, while Iago was intended to be calm and collected with a sinister British accent. The filmmakers later realized that making Jafar the calm type would make him much scarier, so the duo's personalities were swapped. Number 32. The directors immediately casted Jonathan Freeman as Jafar upon just listening to his voice. When they finally met the man behind the villain, they were surprised to find that the sinister voice belonged to somebody that looked so innocent and good-hearted. According to the character's supervising animator, Andreas Deha, Freeman's voice didn't match his body at all. Number 33. Deha has a talent for bringing Disney villains to life. He's also worked on Scar from The Lion King and Gaston from Beauty and the Beast. Number 34. The animators designed the genie for Robin Williams specifically. They wanted the wish to be mercurial, as Williams was famous for being quite mercurial with his voice during his stand-up routines. Number 35. Even though it was written for him, Jeffrey Katzenberg doubted that they would be able to sign Williams due to money, timing, contracts, and landing an A-lister for a voiceover job. Because of this, he insisted that Clemens and Musker come up with alternatives. Number 36. Prior to Aladdin, actors rarely did voice work unless they were desperate. Voice acting wasn't its own medium, and real actors wanted nothing to do with it. While making The Little Mermaid, Clemens and Musker had written the role of Ursula for comedian B. Arthur, and she had refused the role. But, as we know, Williams did a phenomenal job and changed the game of voice acting forever. Now there's almost always a major celebrity voice featured in every animated movie. Number 37. Some alternate casting choices for Genie were John Candy, Eddie Murphy, Martin Short, John Goodman, and Albert Brooks. All of these actors have lent their voices to a number of Disney characters over the years. Number 38. To convince Williams he was a perfect fit for the Genie, the character's supervising animator, Eric Goldberg, prepared an animated test around a few of Williams' stand-up routines. One of these tests involved a bit on schizophrenia, and the animator turned it into a scene where Genie grew another head and argued with himself, perfectly capturing what it is the character would be. Goldberg says he's sure it wasn't the only factor, but Williams signed the contract shortly after seeing that particular animation. Number 39. Williams voiced the Genie for only $75,000, a very small feat compared to the 8 million price tag attached to his name at the time. He mainly took the pay cut because he wanted to be a part of a Disney animation, and he also wanted to leave behind something special for his own children to enjoy. Number 40. Williams wasn't the only 
A-list comedian amongst Aladdin's cast of voice actors. Gilbert Gottfried provided the loud and obnoxious voice of Jafar's parrot, Iago. The filmmakers decided to cast Gottfried after seeing the comedian's performance in Beverly Hills Cop 2. Number 41. The loudmouth Iago was designed after the pet cockatoo of the character's supervising animator, Will Finn. Like Iago, Finn's bird would alternate from being very quiet and docile to becoming very loud on a dime. Number 42. The reason Iago defies all logic and has teeth is because Will Finn didn't think you could get the most out of a Gottfried performance without incorporating the comedian's iconic teeth into the character. Number 43. While Jafar himself may have a fancy parrot as a companion, Freeman actually has a phobia of birds. Number 44. Jeffrey Katzenberg was worried that Aladdin was going to turn into a Saturday Night Live skit thanks to Robin Williams' bevy of impressions. In order to cut down on the SNL feel, Disney tried to add a kid-pleasing element for every Williams riff. One part comedy, one part family fun. That's a recipe for success. Number 45. Aladdin also marked the return of legendary composer Alan Menken. Quick, think of a Disney song. Chances are Menken composed it. He's composed songs for The Little Mermaid, Beauty and the Beast, Aladdin, Pocahontas, the Hunchback of Notre Dame, Hercules, Home on the Range, Enchanted, and Tangled. Number 46. The song One Jump Ahead replaced another song called Proud of Your Boy, which focused on a scrapped plot point where Aladdin was determined to make his mother proud by moving up from being a street urchin into somebody truly great. The song was scrapped when it was decided that the film should head in a more comical direction. However, the song did end up coming back for the Broadway edition of Aladdin, and Clay Aiken sung it on the DVD. Number 47. That wasn't the only song cut. Menken composed eight other songs for this movie. There were songs for Jafar, Aladdin's friends, the ones that got the cut, and Aladdin himself. The songs were cut for various reasons, but can be heard on the special edition DVD. Number 48. Renowned composer Howard Ashman was paired with Menken to create Aladdin's legendary soundtrack. The duo had previously broken ground with their collaborative efforts on Disney films like The Little Mermaid and Beauty and the Beast. Number 49. Aladdin was the last movie Ashman worked on before he passed away from AIDS in 1991. He had crafted the songs Friends Like Me, Prince Ali, and Arabian Nights. Number 50. After the death of Ashman, Disney brought in Tim Rice to help Menken finish out the music for the movie. Rice later went on to work with Elton John for The Lion King. Number 51. The first song that Menken and Rice worked on together was the Academy Award winning A Whole New World. Number 52. As it appears in the film, the Arabian Nights song is only a fraction of the length it was originally written to be. It was trimmed down significantly to improve the pacing of the film. Number 53. Unlike most soundtrack recording sessions, the voice talent of Aladdin actually performed alongside a 75-piece orchestra live with only the thin wall of a glass booth separating them. Number 54. Kane has only sung A Whole New World three times. He got it right on his first and only try during the recording session. The second time was during his wedding where he performed the song at his own reception. The third was on an airing of ABC's Good Morning America where he was reunited with Leah Salonga and performed the song as they did over 20 years earlier. Number 55. Jafar was originally meant to have his own song during his final encounter with Aladdin, but the songwriters didn't have the time to write more new songs. Plus, the animators were worried that a long song would interfere with the scene's flow. They compromised with a reprise of Prince Ali performed by Jafar. Number 56. In the preview screenings for the movie, nobody clapped after listening to the song, so animators added the applause sign at the end of Friend Like Me. During the next test screening, it worked, and the people clapped when they saw the sign, so the animators kept it in the movie. Good job, animators. Number 57. Much like Pinocchio's growing nose, the feather on Aladdin's turban falls onto his face whenever he tells a lie. Just like I said in the intro. Number 58. The Warner Brothers cartoons approve, or at least their director did. Chuck Jones called Aladdin the funniest feature ever made. Number 59. Goldberg said that he designed the genie to be Jewish, and Williams followed suit by adding bits of Yiddish into Genie's dialogue. Number 60. Throughout the movie, Genie transforms into roughly 70 different characters, including a goat, cheetah, a bumblebee, a dog, and a dragon. Number 61. Don't worry, we didn't forget the celebrity ones. There are just so many that we had to include them as their own fact. Genie also references 15 celebrities. Ready for the list? Here we go. Arnold Schwarzenegger, Jack Nicholson, Rodney Dangerfield, Robert De Niro, Groucho Marx, Peter Lorre, Arsenio Hall, Walter Brennan, William F. Buckley Jr., Cab Calloway, Carol Channing, Mary Hart, Ed Sullivan, Senior Wences, and Jerry Lewis. That's a lot of celebrities. Number 62. Genie also transforms into one more celebrity, Robin Williams himself. The goofy hat and Hawaiian shirt that Genie wears at the end of the film is a nod to Williams' wardrobe in a short Back to Neverland. Back to Neverland was a video that played during the Disney Animation Tour at Disney Hollywood Studios Park in Orlando, Florida. Number 63. This isn't the first time that Genie resembled his voice actor. In the sequel, Aladdin and the King of Thieves, Genie transforms into another famous Williams character, Mrs. Doubtfire. Help is on the way!
Number 64. Genie also makes a Disney-fied transformation as well. Just before he turns Aladdin into Prince Ali, the Genie transforms into Pinocchio. Genie's Pinocchio gag was actually an inadvertent brainchild of Robin Williams, who made a sound in the recording booth that Eric Goldberg recognized as the sound Robin Williams would make during some of his stand-up routines that symbolized someone's nose growing because they had lied. Goldberg then convinced the animators to visualize the gag as the cameo we know today. Number 65. Believe it or not, there were supposed to be even more transformations in the movie. Among the list that got cut were Elmer Fudd, Glinda the Good Witch, Obi-Wan Kenobi, and of course, Mickey Mouse. Oh boy! Number 66. Alright, so, the Pinocchio transformation was pretty obvious, but did you notice the other Disney Easter eggs in the movie? There's also the Beast in the Sultan's Animal Stack, Sebastian in Genie's Prince Cookbook, and Mickey Mouse when Raja transforms. Number 67. Genie's impressions were all Williams doing. The script called for archetypes like a game show host and evangelist, but on the first day of recording, Williams came out with celebrity impressions and Clements and Muskert loved it. Number 68. A master of impressions, Robin Williams recorded every line as 20 different characters. Number 69. Williams recorded all of his dialogue in four four-hour sessions. So yes, every line, 20 different times in 16 hours. This man was a legend. Number 70. As a tribute to Williams, Goldberg listened to all 16 hours of his recorded lines, took some of the funniest ones, and storyboarded them for the extra on Blu-ray release of Aladdin. Number 71. The directors have stated that the genie's pop culture references are completely anachronistic to the film's story and that he can make them because he's a godlike entity that transcends both space and time. They go on to say that he's not making these jokes to entertain the characters in the film, but as a means to entertain himself. Number 72. The animators were concerned that people wouldn't laugh at William's celebrity impressions if they didn't know who it was he was impersonating, so they were sure to make Genie turn into an exaggerated and goofy version of the celebrity so that the impressions would be seen as just another funny character that the Genie was turning into. Number 73. One of the biggest challenges Weinger faced when voicing Aladdin was working off of Williams, who would frequently cause him to laugh during his takes. Williams once caused Weinger to laugh so hard he actually fell out of his chair. Number 74. Goldberg compared Williams' time in the recording booth to a road trip. He said that the script was more of a road map that Williams barely ever followed, creating hundreds upon hundreds of his own hilarious detours. Number 75. Unsurprisingly, Williams is a pretty busy guy and quite in demand. He did work on Aladdin during his downtime while filming Steven Spielberg's film Hook. Number 76. While the peddler's speaking voice was done by Williams, his singing voice was actually provided by Broadway star Bruce Adler. Number 77. Clements and Musker originally had a scene written for the peddler when he's going through his various items with the viewer, but what they had written wasn't quite meshing with Williams' performance. Katzenberg told the directors to simply bring Williams to a stage, lay out a pile of junk for him, and let him sort through the junk and improvise with it. Sure enough, this method clicked, giving the filmmakers over an hour of material for this one scene alone. Number 78. Most fans suspected the peddler to really be the genie. Blue clothes, red waistband, bushy eyebrows with a curly beard. Let's also not forget that they're the only two characters in the whole movie who only have four fingers. Coincidence? We think not. And guess what? Clements and Musker have even confirmed it. Originally, the genie was going to reveal himself as the peddler at the end of the movie, but the scene got cut. Number 79. In the original Arabian Nights story of Aladdin, the genie provided Aladdin with unlimited wishes. It was actually the writers on Disney's Aladdin that came up with the concept of the genie granting only three wishes. They felt this choice would make Aladdin's journey much more challenging with higher stakes. Number 80. In Friend Like Me, genie sings that Sherazad had a thousand tales. Sherazad was the author and teller of the stories from a thousand and one Arabian Nights, of which Aladdin originally comes from. Bonus fact, there aren't really a thousand tales, but she did allegedly keep a sultan entertained for a thousand and one nights. Number 81. Genie also mentions Alibaba and the 40 Thieves, whose story was the basis for the Aladdin sequel, Aladdin and the King of Thieves. Aladdin's dad, Kasim, is even named after one of the stars of the story. Number 82. Genie's nickname for Aladdin, Al, was improvised by Williams during his first recording session. The filmmakers then incorporated the nickname into the script because they thought it built upon the growing friendship between Aladdin and the Genie. Number 83. According to the directors, Williams' longest string of improv came from the scene where the Genie was cheering Aladdin on during his battle with Jafar. In the grand scheme of it all, only a speck of what Williams recorded was actually used. There were more cutbacks to the Genie plan during the fight, but the filmmakers thought it took away from the intensity of the conflict and narrowed it down to the few we see in the film today. Number 84. Williams frequently made improvisations that would be seen as a bit too colorful for a Disney film. The directors had to remind Williams to keep things clean more times than you would think. Godfrey had the same problem whenever he was asked to improvise, and yes, they were recorded. No, we will never hear them. Number 85. Williams accidentally made the movie longer. No, really. The animators had to extend some of the pauses after Genie's lines to make room for laughter. Number 86. Jafar and Iago had such good chemistry because Gottfried and Freeman would often record their lines together, something that didn't happen all that often in animation at the time. Their collective laughter was deemed to be so important that the directors would just record the two laughing together for up to 15 minutes straight at a time. Number 87. Williams wasn't the only one on film doing impressions of existing personalities. Iago's line, on a scale of 1 to 10, you are an 11, is a jab at the Los Angeles film critic Gary 
Aretha Franklin and his rating scale. Number 88. Disney was worried that Iago's line, oh, excellent judge, yeah, sure, not, would lead to a legal battle with Michael Myers' lawyers, as not was a famous catchphrase coined by Myers for his film, Wayne's World. Luckily, the reference got to stay in the film and went unpunished after its official release. Number 89. The constant pain and suffering Iago goes through was brought about by a word of advice Goffrey would constantly give the animators, when in doubt, hurt the bird. Sure enough, Iago's physical torment became one of the most positively received aspects of the film, reminding us why Gottfried is one of the best comedians in the business. Number 90. Animators studied Freeman's recording sessions in order to perfect Jafar's mouth movements. Number 91. Freeman's mouth movements were apparently the quintessential Jafar, as he currently stars as Jafar in the Broadway version of Aladdin 20 plus years later, and he's still playing the same character. Freeman says he refers to this part of his life as us, or we, meaning Jafar and himself. Number 92. The two characters that Aladdin stands between that negatively comment on Prince Ahmed when he arrives in Agrabah are the animated cameos of the film's directors, John Musker and Ron Clements. They even provided the voices of their respective animated alter egos. Number 93. There's an entire musical based on the idea of Jafar being the good guy. It's called Twisted, the untold story of the royal vizier, and tells the story of a vizier just trying to do his job, but a stupid street rat named Aladdin keeps getting in the way. Number 94. Jasmine is the only Disney princess to kiss a villain. Anna came pretty close in Frozen, but Jasmine still holds the crown. Number 95. The first scene of the film was designed to look like it was shot in one continuous take, similar to films like Orson Welles' Touch of Evil, whose first scene is actually one continuous take. Number 96. The genie's armbands were not originally designed with the intent of being a symbol of his imprisonment. It was a last minute decision by the directors because they needed something to visually symbolize the genie's freedom. On reflection, the directors don't like the way genie looks without them, claiming he looks naked without his bands. Number 97. Aladdin was the highest grossing movie of 1992. It brought in $217 million in the US and over 500 million worldwide. Number 98. Aladdin was nominated for a total of four Oscar categories and won two of them. Mencken won for Best Original Score and took home another award with Tim Rice for their song, A Whole New World. Number 99. The Academy apparently turned down the movie for Best Adapted Screenplay because so much of the dialogue was improvised. Number 100. As of July 2015, Disney is developing a live action prequel to Aladdin simply called Genies. Not much is known about the film at this time, but it will explore the realm of the genies and will tell the story of how one particular genie became trapped inside the magic lamp. Number 101. Jafar originally shouted the phrase Razaul Azadani to open the Cave of Wonders, the phrase actually being the name of one of Aladdin's layout supervisors. This line was cut over the possibility that the name would be misconstrued as something inappropriate or offensive in a Middle Eastern language. Number 102. The name of the leader of the guards in the films is Razaul, yet another reference to Razaul Azadani. Number 103. The directors refer to Jasmine as a bird in a cage wishing to be set free. This symbolism is visualized with the canopy above the princess's bed, which was designed to resemble a birdcage. Number 104. According to Glenn Keane, the animators originally wanted a real-life visual reference as to how Aladdin would roll an apple off his shoulder, but nobody was able to pull it off except for Aladdin himself. Number 105. The magic carpet was an element created for the Disney film. There was no such object in the original story of Aladdin found in the tales of Arabian Nights. It was created using a combination of traditional hand-drawn animation and computer animation. The animators saw the process as an enhancement of old techniques, not a replacement. Number 106. According to Eric Goldberg, the challenge in characterizing the magic carpet was having a moat through its actions as opposed to things like a voice or a face. The animators looked back to actors from the silent era of filmmaking like Charlie Chaplin to successfully overcome the carpet's lack of traditional communication and emotion. Number 107. The directors have busted the age-old urban legend of Aladdin saying, good teenagers, take off your clothes. They claim Aladdin is actually saying, good tiger, take off, scat, go. The reason Jasmine looks at him suspiciously after delivering this line is because his turban is starting to fall off and she's beginning to piece together that Prince Ali and Aladdin are one and the same, not because of his supposedly sketchy comment. Yeah, sure. Whatever you say, guys. Extra fact. The animators wanted the magic carpet escape sequence to feel like a roller coaster ride, so they sent Razul Azadani to the Magic Mountain Amusement Park in California where he brought a camera onto a roller coaster. He had to ride the roller coaster twice because he accidentally left the lens cap on the first time around. Extra fact. The Prince Ali sequence was designed to resemble the annual Macy's Thanksgiving Day Parade in New York City. Extra fact. Aladdin's method of using the severed rolling tower's window opening to survive being crushed is taken directly from a gag made famous by actor and comedian Buster Keaton in the silent film Steamboat Bill Jr., where he survives a house falling on top of him by conveniently standing in a spot where the falling house's window opening would prevent his demise. Extra fact. The hourglass Jasmine is trapped in during the final battle between Aladdin and Jafar is a visual pun for a device used in films in their third act known as a ticking clock, where the protagonist is trying to prevent something bad from happening with the camera constantly cutting back to a point of tension in the scene that represents a limited amount of time to prevent that bad thing from happening. Jasmine 
unintentionally drowning in the hourglass makes this device more literal. Extra fact, the filmmakers were originally worried that the battle between Jafar and Aladdin would get so violent and extreme that it would land the film a PG rating. Fortunately for them, the ratings board gave it a G rating on its first and only submission. The directors were hit with a sense of doubt and paranoia shortly afterward, now worrying over the possibility that the scene wasn't as intense or dark as it could have been. Extra fact, animator Kathy Zielinski is truly devoted to her craft. She spent the entirety of her pregnancy working on the film and the instant all of her scenes had been completed, her water conveniently broke. Extra fact, fans of Raiders of the Lost Ark may notice that much of the imagery used in the sequence where Aladdin takes the lamp resembles scenes from the Spielberg film. When Disney held the screening Steven Spielberg attended, the filmmakers apologized for stealing so much of his imagery in the sequence, to which he stated he didn't actually mind because he stole the imagery in Raiders from other films. Thanks for watching 107 Facts You Should Know About Aladdin. Which moment in the movie is your favorite? Let us know in the comments below. And if you like what you just saw, then check out some of our other 107 Fact videos by clicking the annotations or the links in the description. And be sure to subscribe to the channel Fred Raider so you don't miss out on any of our videos. Because remember, Fred Raider loves you.